Okay, then I, I started with this um, the slide because I want to say thank you to Maria Laura. This is a, this is a seminar part of the alumni network. Uh, as you can see, there is presence from people from all over the world. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Maria Laura, for keeping up this, uh, this important work for the Institute and, and for everyone. I think all of us as alumni uh, that study at IG are very interested in keeping always up to date with different things. Um, just one fast question. I, I just want to confirm that you are seeing my slides. Uh, Abraham or uh, Jose? Yes, everything is there? Okay. Now, um, well, what I um, uh, have prepared for today is, uh, uh, is uh, precisely this uh, discussion about what is artificial intelligence, how artificial intelligence is uh, making a change in, in, in water resources, and uh, I'm seeing from the perspective of hydroinformatics, and hydroinformatics at IHE has been bringing this together in different ways. Um, I have to acknowledge uh, a lot of this work. Uh, 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 Professor Dimitri Salomatin has been here for already for some uh, years at IHE, and he has been always pushing new technologies, uh, implementing new areas, uh, always something uh, that can be applied and can be new, it's studied, it's implemented, it's uh, tested. And therefore, uh, what you're going to see here goes like in that framework of ideas that have been developed at IHE. So w where to start in all these things? Um, this this uh, presentation is artificial intelligence. And it could uh, be interpreted as complex as uh, if you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Online, you will see that is the field devoted to building artificial animals or at least artificial creatures that are in the suitable context appear to be like an animal. Uh, and for many artificial persons, at least artificial creatures, that is suitable context. So as you can see, it's very, very cumbersome definitions that, uh, well, we, we really don't know how to understand that. But if you go into a simple, not also uh, technical uh, description, or well, maybe approved one, Wikipedia is may, mainly used for this type of, of of finding information and descriptions. And Wikipedia uh, says that is intelligence demonstrated by machines. Then now it's more up to something that we can understand a machine that that is an intelligence. And unlike the natural intelligence, is displayed by animals and humans. Um, this is this is different. It is leading um, artificial intelligence nowadays talk about intelligent agents, and these agents are uh, uh, devices that perceive its environment and take actions that maximize its chance of successfully achieving its goals. And and this is this can be if you look at that uh, sentence, it can be just a simple sensor on the wall where you just pass and the light turns on. You pass and the doors open. You, you enter into a room and the temperature regulates. You enter to a room and the light regulates according to the day, such that you have a friendly environment. So these many small things can be interpreted as AI type of things. And, and, and this goes even with the, the, the concept of some people in electronics called domotic that make uh, intelligent houses. So you, you clap your hands and the lights turn on. Or you say a voice and talk to some device and the device opens the door, closes the door, select alarms and so on. That's called intelligent houses. So indeed this, this, this definition fits kind of this type of things. Another uh, uh, part of this definition it says the colloquial term artificial intelligence is often used uh, to describe machines or computers that mi mimic cognitive functions that human associate with human mind. And that's another point of view that uh, in the same context, computers are these machines, right? Kind of uh, develop, analyze, and, and, and provide some, some responses in the context of what you are telling them. So artificial intelligence uh, so far, yeah, it's kind of uh, having some sort of machine that helps to respond uh, in a certain way understanding what is around it okay now where this this came from uh, we can say that the computers came in, uh, from the first talks and, and the mind paper of 1950 from Alan Turing uh, he argues the question can a machine think 
And, and six years after this question came from Alan Turing with this paper, uh, the concept of the term in Dormant Conference in 1956, uh, artificial intelligence born. That was the first time many researchers started to talk about artificial intelligence. So uh, in, from that perspective, we have computers, uh, where it started the, the concept, then programming on top of the computers, then came internet, it was a change in paradigm, and it started to, to still have a lot of things uh, ongoing. And the last part is artificial intelligence on top of all these things. So what I'm going to present in this uh, following 20, 25 minutes um, will cover the development and at the end I will show four examples of artificial intelligence now from the most modern concept point of view. But I will show you different uh, paradigms that have been growing and you are still probably people working in water resources are working with some of these paradigms in, in, in day to day life. So uh, the first thing was the computer, the device, and, and that device, uh, uh, the computer, every computer has some memory, and you will see about uh, the RAM memory when you're buying a laptop, the memory long term that your hard drive and you want to move it from one side to the other through your USB, you have every computer have a central processing unit, so it will process all your information, and every computer have a ALU, which is an arithmetic logic unit, which will process the mathematical component of that. And then you have peripherals that are the ones that uh, allow you to interact with the machine. So kind of the computer already is kind of mimicking this uh, uh, concept of what uh, is needed to be able to uh, understand uh, some artificial way to reproduce things. After we got the computer, then we started to program uh, on top of it, so solve many tasks. How can we make computer do more and more and more things? And this was a boom uh, from all type of areas of science. Then the, the main goal on this, as you see here in the second part, is automate or program activities. How can I reproduce a very complex problem that I solved in one place, create a program, and use it to solve another and another and another? Uh, the main principles of this um, automation in programming is has only two, two components. The first one is just have a logical decision. If you have uh, some uh, condition, then do something. That's the, the, the basic principle of programming. And the second basic principle of solving is are loops. So how can I do something many times, iterate it, so for a condition, do something? until something happened. So you have these two components that allow you to do almost everything in, in, in programming. And that, I would say, uh, is, the, is the main, uh, let's say, uh, challenge uh, to how to use these two uh, components to build and build and build and build much more complex uh, automation in, 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 with a computer. Uh, but that was the, the, the beginning, and uh, the beginning growed into programming in water resources. And this was, uh, I would say, hydroinformatics, that programming uh, and that idea of being able to use these uh, tools uh, came with the numerical methods to solve uh, physical equations. And we had, uh, in those days, hydroinformatics, Michael Abbott, IHE Delft in the Netherlands, they started to think about how can we build models that can uh, represent fluid dynamics from the basic equations. So they started to move from what was before uh, a, a conceptual model, a model, uh, physical model, into uh, much more complex representations where we solve the uh, fluid equations. We can uh, evaluate cross sections in a river, see where they are going to inundate it. We can build hydrological models that uh, flow, uh, uh, that can show the flow that will happen in certain moments, inundation areas, uh, water depth, and so on. So that's kind of uh, an example on, on this uh, part of programming. But it didn't stop there. And uh, when you finish that, that concept on, on, on programming, you move into internet and the cloud. And how internet and the cloud started? Well, you had uh, these machines, we had these models, you, you just saw them and in water resources, at least this example is in water resources, is how they can communicate, 
how can one office that has one information in one place and another has another, how the, the computers can communicate and then it moved, we need to communicate faster. So they started to create the networks between computers. But then we need to share information and then the, the networks start to grow and grow, capacity, distance and so on. And reach a level where the communication and information was not constrained, was open. So everyone could move uh, and start to add the information and this end up in the new social world of digital uh, citizens. Everyone has its profile, everyone has its place where they are sharing what they are happening. Uh, there are different types of, of, of uh, spaces where you can contribute and you can say what you what you are thinking, what you are doing. Uh, so that that created a kind of uh, an unexpected uh, uh, space in, in this uh, technological development. But as well, there was a competition in one side uh, from all the internet. If you have a large technology that covers all the world, you have a lot of information and want to search along it how to solve this problem of searching through hundreds of thousands of, uh, of data. And that was uh, the, 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 the different internet searchers. There used to be Digital AltaVista, there was Yahoo, there was uh, MSN Hotmail. Still, there are many, many search engines. But Google took the, the lead. It seems that it was able to uh, uh, respond to what the people wanted. If you want to uh, know about something, then uh, it, the most accurate one was Google, and then let's say he became, the company became rich, it would be the largest in the world in that moment, only because of the search engine. But um, to complete the story of what this have provided us, it, it end up in now, this uh, search engine became like a kind of a game, a kind of a, artificial intelligent uh, space where you can nowadays ask what's the weather in uh, uh, any country in Latin America? What is the currency conversion right now? What uh, is happening in uh, in Australia? So you right now you, you can even say how can I cook something? What, where can I find uh, a place to, to replace my thing? So it's, as you can see this starts to become uh, and, and uh, kind of intelligent responses to, to everything that you want and it's only based on searching through databases, only looking what is there. It's nothing uh, really intelligent behind but it's answering all the questions that you have. That uh, paradigm in water resources end up in what we have right now on water related uh, data information about the, the weather, sensors in real time that we can have right now with the different devices, information about extreme events. Uh, this is also an important thing because uh, in the past something could be happening in Africa, in America, in Latin America or whatever and no one knew about it or was not so well informed but now everything is connected. So it would appear that uh, now you, you can understand what, more what is happening worldwide before it was not possible. And the, the concept of remote modeling in what resources, this was something very interesting. In the year 2002, they started a program called Hydro Europe. And this, uh, I, I mentioned this because it's the concept where, where I started to see for first time uh, um, uh, remote modeling. How can people access models, complex systems uh, through uh, internet? And uh, Hydro Europe in 2003, in fact, this is my batch on, on the Master of Science in, in IHE. Uh, I am there somewhere with some glasses uh, and uh, also Professor Joanna Popescu which was the, the leader on this uh, program uh, through Europe and there were four or five countries and what they wanted to do with this program is that we all in different countries were accessing the same model but each one working in some characteristics and, and, and problem and we had to build a project out of all this very complex uh, information system. And at the end, we went all into France and Nice, and we met the people. We met the, the we went along the, the the region, understand the the things that were happening. But before that, we were three months working online with remote uh, systems. So this was a, a an interesting uh, change in paradigm. Everyone started to think about how to do models and to be able to share them. Now, reaching the 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 area of of more advanced things in water resources. We can say that 
this end up in now we have more information there is a boom of how to deal with extreme events uh, you you can see that due to the fact that the news about the events are happening everywhere uh, we we are not more aware so now we we want to deal with extremes we want to see how the other people are dealing with the streams we we want to be more informed and knowledgeable in the areas of risk how much risk right now i'm having uh, right now we are more prone for uh, experience like uh, which type of models are they using? What type of infrastructure have they implemented? What sustainable development interventions can I do? All this information is there. Now, the last thing that you can see in this uh, uh, boom of the internet is that now you have social media in water. If some expert in water wants to find a job, that's water jobs. If there are, there are many, many groups about risk risking extremes in floods, in droughts, in water management, uh, diplomacy, and so on. There are government awareness organizations, social media, even Facebook for, for, for cities, for regions, for uh, um, awareness of extreme events, and so on. So this, this is very interesting that it came into that. But now that I moved the last, uh, I think I counted myself t 10 minutes to, to reach here. I don't know if I, it took 10 or less or more, but um, this is artificial intelligence now. And what you are seeing in these slides is the um, the concept on, on, on different uh, yeah, specialized websites about how the artificial intelligence developed, which basically is what I, I, I said uh, in, uh, in this last five, uh, 10 minutes is okay the concept started but it was a little bit vague everyone was thinking about what can be and what is and there was uh, always fears of what can be reached the 1980s and, uh, and 2010 there was machine learning moving and starting and from 2010 there was a shift in paradigm again on uh, a competition uh, an international competition on, on animation pattern recognitions where uh, an algorithm uh, that used deep learning uh, made a, a breakthrough it managed to improve the performance of the of the of the classifier or, or to identify things uh, with with uh, impressive uh, accuracy and, and uh, relatively very fast and the nowadays uh, yeah you any one of you can install in five minutes uh, uh, this uh, network of 23 layers and, and you can identify many objects there is a test where you put the camera and you put your, your cup or your copy cup and it will tell you it, that's a copy cup and it is really simple that's um, i encourage you to explore these type of things it's really simple and so on but okay what is the context of artificial uh, intelligence and, and, and deep learning or, or and machine learning? I would say the machine learning in general is more wider and that's why here I will talk of most of the things about machine learning. Uh, it's the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And that just that sentence makes a, a very important shift in paradigm. So nowadays there are many people saying you don't need to learn how to program now you just put a machine learning that will program in between brackets program the thing for you what's the meaning you have inputs and outputs and use in the past you had to learn what were all the processes, and you had to program all the processes to be able with one input obtain one output now not anymore now you start to think about oh hey i have this data from the input and i want to obtain these outputs every time that i have this combination i need to have this type of, of responses. And then if you build a table that allow you to know what is happening inside from the action and what is the consequence, you can build a neural network without having to program thousands of lines of code. And that's that's uh, one of the, the things that I want to show you here, how it works. So uh, in this concept, artificial intelligence is building from knowledge from mathematical equations. It's a framework, let's say now we are here talking in more in detail on, on machine learning and it's built from different areas of science so terminology sometimes in different papers it starts to be to be cumbersome so experts in finance talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning precisely in their own terms and they develop their own algorithms people that are working in image recognition another one 
people that are working in, in, in databases and big, large databases talking in other contexts. So that's why having all these areas of development uh, requires some, some time to, to be understood and know what is the best to do. It's not magic. You cannot just select one thing and it will solve your problem. You need to really uh, go a bit deep into it. Um, I don't know. Uh, I Somehow I lost uh, the presentation. I don't know if... Hello. Can you uh, see it there, Abraham? Can you yeah. hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Uh, would you like me to bring your presentation back? Yes, please. Sorry. I, uh, yeah. Somehow I pressed to change. Not, not this. Yeah, thank you. She said it's not. Mm -mm. Yep. Do you see it now? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yes, I see it. Thank you. Okay, now uh, continue with the, the the concept of machine learning, and now uh, I want to bring more more ideas and and. Uh, bring that now down to earth so you understand what is machine learning and this will open a bit the scope for what uh, uh, Theo and uh, Jose will present uh, in a few minutes. So what is machine learning? So the, the machine learning is uh, described as the use and development of computer systems that are able to learn and adapt without following instructions. Okay, And then here you have inputs and outputs on the on the right you have a, a real system and what you want to represent is that when something happened in the system you have some uh, output that uh, that you are measuring and you're observing and then you want your machine learning to learn from that experience and receive the same input know what is the output and he will produce an output and you need to differentiate the the if the predicted output should be equal to your observed output and this is trying to learning is minimized the difference between both so how can you change the the parameters inside the machine learning data driven model uh, to uh, make the best prediction on on what would happen in real life and this this uh, this uh, slide is from the lecture from Dimitri Solomatin in IHE in 2009 uh, and where he, most of this uh, concept of machine learning has been uh, explained as data-driven models. So you will find a lot of literature publications where machine learning has been described in this area of science as data-driven models. Oops, again. Okay. Somehow if I press a space it, it jumps here. Sorry, Abraham. I will try not to press a space. Uh, okay, now to to understand a bit more these systems and and how they became um, so 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 um, how they work and and why they start to become complex once in a while when you start to grow and grow the problem uh, is uh, this thing like a transition from one neuron. What is one neuron in these concepts of of, of uh, of machine learning, and I'm giving the example of the one of the most well-known um, algorithms, which is the the MLP, multi-layer perceptron network. So everyone that thinks about machine learning uh, identifies it with the neural networks, although it's not like that. There are many many types of uh, networks, and there are many type of algorithms that feel that are part of machine learning that are not net neural networks. But uh, in this case, I wanted to. Uh, Mention this at the core because, uh, well, some of the things that is going to, to are going to present Jose and uh, and uh, some of you is are, are in this area of uh, of work. So one neuron is simply uh, like what you're seeing on the screen. It's like a kind of uh, linear regression. You have x1, x2, x3 multiplied by a weight one, weight two, weight three, and if that combination of values of uh, your input multiplied by a W, W is a, any, a, a number that you need to fit such that your value of A will tell you that is 1 if it's one class and 0 is if it's then the other class. 
they call this activation. So it activates and says, for example, it, it, it's above the threshold. It's going to be a flood. It's below the threshold. Then it's not a, not a flood. In in normal machine learning or when you are looking in other areas of science, it says, oh, that's a a dog, not a dog. It's a cat, not a cat. Yeah, you know, it's it's black and white. And this was more or less the most simple way to see these activation functions. The the next uh, level is to um, see it in, in, in this uh, two-dimensional. So this regression, in fact, is a line. And what you are trying to find is the slope and the place uh, where the line should go, such that you classify all your points in according to what they are. So you already know that the blue points on the right are one class and the crosses are another. So you need to find the slope of this red line. That's that slope is this W uh, and the bias parameter, of course, to displace it. Uh, and if you find that, that exactly divide both, then you have a classifier. Everything above the line is a cross, below the line is, is a dot. That's uh, the, the first concept of one neuron, which is this one. But what if you combine that with another, with another, with another, with another, and with another, and finally with another, and you have what is called a multi-layer. So each one of these rows or these columns of, uh, of uh, sorry, each one of these uh, rows is one um, one layer, and that's what they call this multi-layer. And this is this was one of the the, the, the beginnings of, of neural networks, and they say that this is a universal approximator. The challenge here is that you have so many nodes, and every one of these lines that you see there is a weight. And uh, to be able to learn, and that the learning is identifying those weights. The, well, how can I find the weights that will perform the task of classifying or being able to let me know that certain uh, combination of inputs will uh, have some result. And as you can see, that's, that's, a, that's the challenge, learning. And learning is an optimization problem. How can I optimize the weights such that they will uh, produce what I want? So uh, where these machine learnings are applied, so you will find the experts in, in, in finance time series that uh, works with things like this, or even in, in voice recognition. Uh, but in, in water resources, we use it to, to forecast or to simulate rain world runoff. Options, pattern recognition, you can find it like this in other areas of science. In water resources, we try to look at remote sensing images to try to identify patterns of floods or patterns of crops or whatever. In uh, other science, large colliding hydron in physics uh, in water resources. We have big data in, in atmospheric science every second in every place and there, every minute, every hour, every model simulating any scenario of climate change. You have big data there. Um, in text mining, uh, we have in, in general in internet, Google systems and so on. In, in water resources, well, we are just right now starting to understand how can we convert this qualitative data into quantitative data. Now, uh, again, going deeper, where, where is this AI in water resources? How can, uh, and, and you can find many applications nowadays that use uh, machine learning for simulation of events, from forecasting rain or, or discharge for early warning systems and even building surrogate models that replace uh, operational systems, so like real-time controlled situations where you want them to reproduce or represent something uh, that uh, yeah that, that you you want to achieve certain performance. So this is this first paradigm in water resources contemplates only time series, and there is most of the time no uh, spatial information. The second one is the image classification in remote sensing. So there are many algorithms and you go to Google Earth Engine and you will find classification problems in remote sensing images, uh, mainly about land use, flood classification and so on. So how can we learn that some pixel in a survey was identified as, as a certain type of crop or certain type of or grass or whatever 
then you go into the image and you look at the place where you did the survey and then you make your remote sensing image to learn this uh, this uh, result in every pixel and then you say okay now if now that i know that that combination of bands in my remote sensing image give this this uh, this value of, of colors that colors in fact is a class which is a land use then i will use it for the whole image and then you reproduce what is happening so mainly this this type of problems are uh, spatial or geo reference information as, as you see they do not work in time it's only one layer or it's a it's a spatial representation and you want to identify what is happening everywhere and if a new image comes you also would like to try to explore the same use of things but it's not explicitly in in, in time the third uh, area of application of artificial intelligence is in decision making and uh, I would say that the last 10 years there have been approach of, of using uh, text mining and recently I would say in the last uh, two or three years there are people who are working with natural language processing that has advanced quite a lot uh, to take information from social qualitative information this, this information is highly abstract and dynamic it's changing every day the news the people tweeting uh, Instagram and so on so this all this information how can you take this information to obtain can okay, you look at this information and, and obtain uh, something that is useful for either for your models or for taking a decision um, and number four uh, of the ones that are I know I'm, I'm aware of all these, uh, uh, some of these applications, is the spatiotemporal models. So let's say agent models, cellular automata models, pattern tracking. So how is spatiotemporal information uh, of dynamic uh, yeah, uh, nature uh, can, can be seen and uh, can be used for replicating what is happening in, in real life. So let's see the, the context. These are the four examples, which uh, uh, with these four examples, I, I, I will finish my presentation. I don't, hope not taking too much time because we started tar tar late. Uh, the first one is flow forecasting. I mentioned it before. If uh, someone wants to make a fo flow forecasting uh, uh, with physics, the, you could go with a very complex physically based model. Most of the time, uh, flow forecasting systems work with conceptual simplified representations, even with the statistical representations. And uh, this is one conceptual model, and uh, although it's uh, one of the simplest models, uh, it has many, many parameters. Uh, what uh, has been with the applications of neural networks is to try to say, okay, what are the inputs and outputs of that uh, situation? So, or either you go to the conceptual model and you program every equation and say, if this is happening, then do this, and if there is a saturation of the flow, then do that. And if there is a level of the groundwater, then put some percolation and change it and put some uh, runoff and so on. So you can put all these type of complex equations or two, say, okay, let's build a, 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 a machine learning model, in this case, a neural network model. What are the, the, the previous time steps, which are in fact the inputs of the normal conceptual model? What is the PT precipitation in time minus one? minus two minus three so what's the lag precipitation what is your lag discharge and then uh, what is the, the 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 output of that what is the discharge at the next time step or what is the discharge at the following uh, forecast horizon and this is how the the network learns uh, learns the, the the real system and then when you use it in real uh, uh, in operation it will reproduce this uh, limitations is that it is fixed time step. So whatever you give him is what he's learning. He and most of the time you read only the the measurements from your device. The, that makes it uh, uh, well. There is no no knowledge representation and is fixed on uh, on your delta t. In a conceptual model or a physical based model, you are representing the physics, so you can play with time. In in this uh, type of models, not. Um, a second example is the uh, optimal reservoir operation, and, and this is uh, in Dominican Republic. Uh, the the um, MSc research of uh, Carlos Tami from Escuela Colombiana de Ingeniería. He just finished, uh, in fact, uh, this week, and was very interesting uh, case. So that's why I am bringing it here. 
This is in the River Juna and the Reservoir Atillo, which is one of the most important in this river basin, and it has a, there have been many, many uh, floods uh, in this region. Uh, the reservoir is meant for producing energy. It also helps on, on uh, the irrigation district and uh, also has been uh, uh, discussed. Oh, sorry, again, space. Uh, Abraham, yes, sorry, can you help? I cannot hear you. <laughs> Somehow is mute. About now? Yes, now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask you to please uh, start winding up. We are running a bit behind time. Yeah, it's only two slides more. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good. Yeah, sorry for, uh, indeed I was thinking in this 30 minutes, but probably... Yeah, thank you, Abraham. Okay, so this is the case study of the Juna River. And uh, let's imagine that, uh, in fact, uh, this is not good, but okay, let's go backwards. Let's imagine that you want, the, 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 we have the last 12 years of of, uh, of operation of this reservoir and there have been many floods and there have been many situations where there was not enough water for the, for the crops in the region. And it was in fact operated uh, trying to, to, to satisfy everyone, but mainly energy production. And that, uh, uh, if, if we look in, in detail, why we, we don't try to learn from what they have? And this is a, a, a relatively recent concept. You learn on, on the past, you build a model that represents what is happening. But after you learn that model, then you say, okay, now I have a representation and I want to, in the future, to uh, uh, solve the, the challenges of the, of the system. I need an optimal energy production and I need a reduction in the terms of uh, flood situation and I need enough water for my crops. So here we build a, a, a neural network uh, model where uh, the three objectives, this was first was built to reproduce what was there happening, uh, to reproduce what you can see in the blue line. Uh, the rainfall is on the upper part, that's an average rain of the, of the system. And the lower line is the green, that is the energy production. And the, the artificial intelligence, there were many, many models built. And finally, we got one that managed to reduce the, the floods. And you see the blue and the red line on the, on the middle graph. And all the events, yeah, maybe 80% of the events were, uh, were resolved by making an intelligent uh, machine learning to take the decisions. And this, this was built on past experience and then optimizing what will be the maximum reduction that you can have in flood with the maximum production of energy with the maximum satisfaction of, uh, of agricultural irrigation. Okay, and then uh, this is third example. As I said, it's only four examples, so Abraham, I'm almost going to finish, sorry. Uh, just mentioned the PhD studies of Vital Diaz. He's the one that's working in the special droughts. It's a case study in Eastern India. Uh, this uh, region is very famous for the production of rice. And uh, there is a situation where uh, if you have a drought in this region, well, you will impact in your crop yield. But the region is so big that to be able to make a survey and to analyze the impact, it will take you like two or three months to be able to, to understand how much was the impact. So we look at past situations and how, how much the crop yield was impacted and we made it learn and by looking at the, the spatial temporal variations of the of the droughts, there is an animation here that I see is not working, but okay. Uh, what is supposed to happen is that these areas starts to change. By learning the changes in the areas, 
we could determine how much drought, how much uh, crop yield will be affected. Now, uh, the, this uh, work was extended, and what you can see here is the whole India, and what we are finding the variations in space and time of each one of the events along uh, a certain number of years, and I think this was 15 years, and then we, we look at how the, the, the patterns, and we made a tracking of all the uh, large events in the lower part, you can see the vectors that show how are the, the, the droughts appearing. And via doing this, you can identify when a drought is going to happen, how it's going to happen, what is the synchronicity of the drought. So this is very, very interesting, and this is all looking at uh, the pattern tracking uh, motions. And the last one is the, the example from the new social media. This is also very, very new. It uh, was in a competition of artificial intelligence in Colombia with 22 universities. And the, the concept is how to, to bring uh, the qualitative information from the network. And uh, what uh, was proposed by Santiago Duarte, the student from Colombia, was to create a, a, a a uh, system that was scrapping, we navigated through the internet, started to extract information from all the newspapers, more than 4,090 news uh, articles, and uh, after extracting, he passes processes with a natural processing language, extracting uh, intelligently the, the, the information such that you can have an index that will tell you if it is good or bad. And he created this app that you can see in the address HTTP Santiago Duarte 09 users earth engine dot app. Uh, and uh, what is going to show you is something like this. This is one of the six apps that you will see there. And what it will show you is the feelings of the people and how this has an index of the health of the rivers, how, how they, they, they are uh, feeling that the river is in a bad condition, a good condition. Since this is analysis is done uh, historically, uh, it was mapped with uh, decisions made by, uh, by people in, in the regions, and we were able to see what wrong decisions led to uh, decay in the information that was from the news, from the people, and from the social media. As well, when there was success in a decision, we also felt the feeling of the, of the, of the people around the system. And that's it. That's uh, my presentation. So th that's so. What you think will be the next AI application in water resources? What this is just to spark ideas, and I hope uh, the ones of uh, Theo and, and Jose can complement, and they for sure will go deeper in, in, in many things.